आतंकवाद ये मानवता का दुश्मन है यही एक देश है जो चारों तरफ आतंकवाद को एक्सपोर्ट करने में लगा हुआ आतंकवाद के सामने न हिंदुस्तान झुका है न हिंदुस्तान झुकेगा आतंकवाद को परास्त करके रहेगा As Prime Minister Modi unveils our response to the Ori attack, let us take a look at how his predecessors have acted in the past to such attacks from Pakistan. Post Kargil, three such provocations come to mind. One was of course the dastardly 26 by 11 siege on Mumbai, which happened under Prime Minister Manmohan Singh's watch. The other was the attack on Parliament in December 2001 when the NDA's Atal Bihari Vajpayee was Prime Minister. And of course the third is the IC 814 hijack. Let us now take a look at how India reacted at that time and compare it to the steps undertaken by Prime Minister Modi. You are stuck to the wind that has been there and I think that I think it was so heavy high there is no information on the identity of the men or their demands. On December 24, 1999, an Indian Airlines Airbus was hijacked shortly after it left Kathmandu for New Delhi. On board were 176 passengers. The hijackers belonged to the Harkat ul Mujahideen, a terrorist group that owed its origins to the ISI. Their demand was the release of several prisoners being held in India, including Masood Azhar. We have evidence to show that hijackers were encouraged by Pakistan. After an initial hard line against bargaining with terrorists, Vajpayee gave in to the pleas of the relatives of the passengers on board and released three terrorists in exchange for the passengers. One of these was Masood Azhar, who went on to Pakistan where he formed the Jaish e Mohammed, the group the government holds responsible for the Uri attack and before that the attack in Pathan Court apart from the parliament attack. Aaj bhi Congress keh de ki wo jo log us jahaz mein the abhi bhi Congress keh de ki unko mar jana chahiye tha. Himmat hai? Hum log aaye hain. Hame government ne kaha hai ki wo jo aapke paas qaidi hain उनको लेके छोड़ना है क्योंकि वो कंधार में जहाज ले गए हैं उससे हमें इसको निकालना है मैंने कहा अल्लाह के वास्ते ये बताओ कि हम टेररिज्म से लड़ने वाले हैं कि हम इतनी भी कुर्बानी नहीं दे सकते हैं वतन के लिए तो किस वतन को बचाने की बात कर रहे हो आई मस्ट टेल यू आई केव एम हेल्प On 13 December 2001, five heavily armed terrorists belonging to the terror group Lakshar e Taiba and Jaish e Mohammed entered the parliament complex in New Delhi and opened fire indiscriminately. The attack led to the death of 12 people, including one civilian. The mastermind behind the attack, Abdul Guru, was arrested, tried, and executed in 2013. The Cabinet Committee on Security met the same evening after the attack and concluded that the Pakistan's ISI was behind it and after a long discussion on options decided that the threat of military action had to be made. Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee ordered troop mobilization and over the month of December half a million soldiers amassed on India's western front. With the possibility of war looking real, Pakistan too withdrew its troops from the Afghan border where they were supporting the US war in Afghanistan. and moved them to the border with India it was only after the us persuaded general pervez musharraf to denounce jihadi groups in a speech in january 2002 that vajpayee relented then again on 26 november 2008 then lakshar e taiba terrorists struck again landing in kolaba in mumbai via a boat from karachi They shot their way to the Chhatrapati Shivaji Railway Terminus, the Taj Hotel, the Oberoi, and the Jewish Center. The city was under siege for more than three days, during which the terrorists killed about 164 people and injured scores others. One of the terrorists, Ajmal Kasab, was caught alive and came clean to his interrogators within hours. As details of what he said emerged in the media, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh considered his response. All options were considered including an air strike to take out the LET headquarters at Muridke and the terrorist training camps in POK. We are not prepared to countenance a situation in which the safety and security of our citizens can be violated with impunity by terrorists. Kal raat ke naam unka sandesh narasha janak raha. Mujhe vishwas hai ki kendra ki sarkar diplomatic level par bhi विश्व के अंदर 
पड़ोसी देश के यहां चल रही इस आतंकवादी प्रवृत्ति और भारत पर हमला करने की इस प्रवृत्ति के संबंध में आवाज उठाएगी और कदम उठाएगी द प्राइम मिनिस्टर वेड मिलिट्री रिटेलिएशन बट द सर्विस चीफ्स आर सपोज टू हैव टोल्ड एन दैट दे डिड नॉट हैव द केपेबिलिटी जस्ट देन बट आर मोस्ट डिसाइसिव रिस्पॉन्स श्योरली केम आफ्टर द ओरी अटैक Prime Minister Modi already angered by the Pathan Ko strike last year was in a combative mood. His first speech after Uri made it clear that the death of the 18 soldiers would be avenged. Aatankvadi kaan khol ke sun le. Ye desh is baat ko kabhi bhulne wala nahi hai. And less than a fortnight after the Uri attack, India struck back. Some terrorist teams had positioned themselves at launch pads along the line of control with an aim to carry out infiltration and terrorist strikes in Jammu and Kashmir and various other metros in our country the indian army conducted surgical strikes last night at these launch pads well that's the story so far We're now going to take a look at the impact of our retaliatory strike and also what next. Moreover, was this the right decision to take? Joining me for this in discussion are we have Brahma Chilani, he's a geostrategic expert and an author. We have Mr. Kaval Sibal, former foreign secretary. We have Ajay Sahani, he's a defense expert. So, Mr. Sahani, what do you think of the? Let's just talk about uh, the action, the retaliatory strike. Was this the right time? Has it sent the right message? What is your reading of it? Well, as far as the timing is concerned, the army had said earlier after the Uri attack that we will strike back at a time and place of our choosing, mm. and I think that has been very, very clearly borne out. Uh, obviously, this is of their choosing because it is very evident in the uh, efficiency of the operation, the clear planning that has gone uh, into it. So, I would suggest the timing is perfect, and I would also suggest that this was the right move. I don't see this as an isolated just the the strike back mm. because if it is just a strike back then it is one of many strikes that we have already carried out against the Pakistanis across the border when they have violated uh, our uh, side of the border. I think this is to be seen as a culmination of all that has happened after Uri. I think of this strike as the exclamation mark at the end of this changing discourse of the range of options that are now being explored by the government mm. of the diplomatic moves that have been made to build up the and that the atmosphere for the strike mm. and the legitimacy of the strike as a result of that globally not a single country in the world okay. including china has actually criticized the indian action okay. and i think uh, that that goes not only as a testament to the timing and the nature mm. of the strike but also of the build up and the uh, legitimacy of the strike uh, that has been created by the government okay mr civil you also give your reading of the strike and also the diplomatic impact the way india played the game you know we had uh, created a huge psychological barrier ourselves by not crossing the line of control despite intense provocation from the pakistani side whether it was the kargil attack or uh, the attack on parliament when we had operation prakram mm. or subsequent terror attacks including bombay somehow we were concerned that we will not be able to control the escalatory ladder and it might end up into some kind of a nuclear standoff or even before that countries might start talking about the danger of a nuclear standoff and we will the whole issue will get internationalized in the wrong context i'm so glad that uh, we have broken the psychological barrier and we have officially said that we have struck across the line of control yeah. so it's a big change now the consequence of this is that mm -hmm. we have opened up a whole lot of space for ourselves militarily diplomatically to now react to pakistan's provocations in a way that hurts pakistan and which deters pakistan earlier pakistan was not deterred they knew the indian reaction uh, already in advance very predictable that uh, we will make some noise we will say zero tolerance of terrorism and within a few months we'll be back into the dialogue mode mm. now they can't be sure because india can react at a time and a place and uh, of its own choosing mm. so this has changed the ball game altogether and has changed pakistan calculus and this to my mind is a huge gain and finally with regard to the diplomatic uh, reaction i think we have prepared our ground extremely well M modi had gone to the gulf countries to all those countries which uh, uh, support uh, pakistan and we have been 
very astute in describing it not as a military operation, but as a counter-terrorism operation. Now, on this issue, nobody can fault us. Correct. That why have you taken action mm. to combat terrorism when the whole world wants to declare a war on terrorism? So it's well played. Well played. And also, when I talked about the timing, Mr. Chirani, you know, uh, not reacting after Pathan Court, but reacting now. Does that make sense to you? Not reacting after Pathan Court didn't make sense to me. <laughs> and in fact, uh, <laughs> it wasn't just Pathan Court. Mm. That the Modi government didn't react to the Hirat uh, attack, uh, didn't uh, didn't react to the Kudaspur Udampur attacks, didn't react to the attacks on Indian consulates in Jalalabad and in uh, Mazar e Sharif. So there was a string of uh, Pakistan backed attacks mm. on Modi's watch. But Hankot, of course, uh, was a watershed moment because uh, the government of India shared intelligence about the attackers with Pakistan. And, in, and even invited the Pakistani team to come to Pathankot, which created a uh, PR problem for the government. So after Uri, yeah. the government was under pressure from the public to act. I think to put this uh, operation in a broader context, this was a limited operation with limited military objectives, yielding limited military benefits. But it's broader political, psychological and diplomatic benefits are much more significant. But if this is going to be a one-off military operation, yes. then the military and non-military benefits accruing from it will gradually get neutralized. So one has to bear in mind that this, as uh, Ambassador Sybil has pointed out, creates immense space for us. But if we do not take advantage of this new situation and go back to the old passive posture, then all the gains accruing from it will likely get neutralized. Because let's face it, one kind of operation of this type, however successful, is not going to dissuade the Pakistani military establishment and its uh, rogue ISI agency mm. to stop, uh, stop proxy war against India. We have to inflict direct costs on the Pakistani military. This operation publicly is being explained as an action not against the Pakistan military, yeah. but and against terrorist, terrorist hmm. launch pads. But we know that unless we do not impose costs on the Pakistan military, the unconventional war that Pakistan is waging against India by terror will continue. Some people say we should have targeted, you know, go after someone, say Hafiz Sayyid, get a symbolic victory also. You know, I don't think any of this matters. As he says, this is a one-off incident. Hmm. Uh, I don't think we can have a continuous succession of military attacks against Pakistan without somehow or the other pushing towards escalation. Hmm. More importantly, I don't think military action is so necessary, except symbolically as retaliation for specific acts now committed, not, not historical acts. What we need to ensure is that the entire range of options that has now been opened out, and very few of which are actually being discussed in the media, hmm. and should not be discussed in the media actually, uh, they are not only concretized into a long-term strategy for this country to be pursued irrespective of Pakistan's conduct. Please understand, every time Pakistan comes to the negotiating table, it hmm. doesn't stop terrorism. And I am very, very certain the first overtures or the first suggestions are already there, virtually lifting language out of Prime Minister Modi's uh, speech at uh, 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 Kozikode. Uh, Nawaz Sharif has now said, we must focus on fighting poverty and backwardness. Huh. So this is how they're going to try to get you back to the table. They are going to say, let's start negotiations to cooperate against the greater evils of backwardness and underdevelopment and poverty mm. instead of fighting each other. Mm. But that won't, they won't dismantle their camps. So our conditionalities must be very, very clear. We must begin an entire and complex process of imposing costs, as Brahma says, mm. on Pakistan and not necessarily militarily. I would suggest overwhelmingly non-militarily. Okay. And not deviate from this plan just because there are some friendly overtures from the other side. We must stick with this, with the conditionality, end all 
infrastructure of terrorism, not end all terrorism. The infrastructure of terrorism must be dismantled entirely to the satisfaction of its victims, not mm. to the satisfactions of, uh, of its uh, perpetrators. perpetrators. So is this, uh, I, I, this attack, is it as landmark as we are, as we are you know, uh, saying it is, or is it just another chapter in the history of India-Pakistan? I think it's a landmark. It is a landmark. Because uh, in it's my the first own time discussions and, uh, and conversations, uh, there has always been this factor that Pakistan is an international actor. We, they want to drag us into a conflict. We have a lot more to uh, suffer if there's a conflict because we want to focus on poverty alleviation, growth. Mm -hmm. uh, we have global aspirations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the entire process will be um, complicated if we get into uh, conflict with Pakistan. Foreign direct investment will not come in. Mm -hmm. The whole manufacturing base we want to develop. All these fears that we had. Now all these fears have been now discarded, and a risk has been taken to go across and describe it as a surgical strike. Hmm. Now, whatever it was in terms of uh, its scope, but if you describe it as a surgical strike, uh, it sends a certain <laughs> message to the Pakistani public and the military that the Indians are doing what the Americans are capable of doing, even if the scope is not the same. <laughs> that they can come hmm. across, go across Pakistani uh, territory, or, let's say on the other side of the line of control okay. hmm. and hit at the targets and come back. Psychologically, uh, this has an impact and General Rahish Sharif, who is now a big hero in Pakistan, hmm. uh, you know, naturally his image will suffer if the Indians get away with this, which is why they're done playing it. Oh, hmm. No, 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 there was actually no surgical strike, there was hmm. no crossing of the border, it was just the usual firing across the border, which is an existential phenomenon, I don't know what they mean by that. <laughs> <laughs> And downplaying it. Ah. This doesn't mean that they won't react, hmm. but they see the problem uh, for themselves. Uh, so, therefore, in the, but I entirely agree with what has been said. And frankly, I have also had an occasion to say this hmm. more officially uh, that uh, they will try to get us into in dialogue mode, and that will be the biggest error we'll make because Pakistan is structurally incapable of making peace with India. They won't make peace with India. New rules of engagement. We're going to discuss that, but after a short break. Welcome back. We are here discussing the impact of India's retaliatory strike after the attack on Uri. Um, Mr. Chalani, you heard everybody, are you in basically in agreement with them that let's not give in, let's not go back to the dialogue table just yet. Let's, you know... The reason why India faces a serious um, problem uh, with Pakistan is because India has not followed a consistent policy in Pakistan. India's policy on Pakistan has not been consistent under any government hmm. since the 1990s, consistent for more than one year. Because they all oh. want that Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> which Whatever the reason. Uh, under Vajpayee, it's, it changed with every season. Hmm. Manmohan's policy, of course, uh, began with the doctrine of securing peace at any cost. And Modi has been in office for two and a half years, and he cannot claim to have pursued a consistent Pakistan policy. Our biggest enemy hmm. is the lack of consistency in our Pakistan policy. If we return to the negotiating table, having an empty dialogue with Pakistan will fritter away all the gains that we have secured now from this single military operation. But I think the, the more important point, a point that Dr. Sani has made, mm. is that we should not expect too much from the military realm. Military cannot deliver decisive results. We have to wage an all-out, relentless, silent war against Pakistan. If Pakistan can wage an undeclared war against India, what mm. prevents India from from waging an undeclared war against Pakistan, employing all the levers of leverage and coercion. And as again, as Dr. Sani pointed out, we'll have to rely largely hmm. on the non-military tools of leverage and coercion to get the results. The military will, of course, will have to play a role, especially the special forces, because this creates room for India now, and it puts Pakistan on notice that the Indians can militarily cross the line of control and take out terrorist launch pads and even kill terrorists. Hmm. But we cannot do this repeatedly. 
So we have to use all the cards that we have, which are quite formidable. Uh, the biggest card that India has, which uh, it's not even seeking to use, uh, until, at least until now, which is a water card. It's the cheapest and, in my view, the most potent mm. source of leverage, more powerful than the nuclear bomb. You must understand the nature of the Pakistani state. Mm. After 9-11, you had Richard Armitage say, we will bomb you back into the Stone Age. They reversed U-turn on every single policy on Afghanistan. And then very quickly, offering their devoted services to the American, they started recovering space for maneuver and began not only sustaining, I mean, part of the bargaining uh, uh, with uh, America for support was actually, you don't interfere in uh, Kashmir, that's between us and India, mm. but very slowly they reopened the Afghanistan theater as well. And 15 years later, America is still taking fatalities in Afghanistan. Not only Afghans, they've lost more than 2,300 people. The Americans have lost more than 2,300 soldiers. Uh, the Allies uh, have lost another odd thousand odd uh, soldiers. And still America is in this constant uh, 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 confusion as to what to do with Pakistan. So you must understand, this is not a country that is going to be very easily uh, controlled. Hmm. They will seek spaces. Now, as far as uh, the nature of what we are doing is concerned, whether it is overt or covert, uh, this is, you see, the, the, the whole theory of uh, protracted war of compellence allows you to use a wide range of tools, many of which are completely open. Mm. I mean, after all, if you uh, go uh, renegotiate the, uh, or, or, or revisit the uh, water arrangement with Pakistan, start utilizing your own right. legitimate share, if you redefine the MFN treat, we withdraw the MFN uh, status. status. There have been two or three other of these little things. You're doing it openly. Mm. If you block their overflights, there's nothing covert about that. Mm. But there are also a very, very range, a wide range of covert instrumentalities. I'm not even talking about it for tax terrorism. I, I don't support that for the simple reason that no country in the world that has supported terrorism has ever been able to escape blowback. There's always blowback. But there are a whole range of other covert tools that can be employed, okay. which I would not even begin to discuss. Okay, last word to you on what uh, we've discussed covert, but uh, tell us more about overt that we can... Well, Balochistan, we won't discuss that. That's okay. I think that was a very good step that uh, we took uh, to raise the Balochistan issue, and we've kept raising it. And in an unprecedented way, the Foreign Minister of India mentioned Balochistan in a UNGA address. We brought it on the international okay. landscape. Uh, we are giving our media is doing a fine job by inviting the Baluchi representatives day in and day out to speak about this, uh, sensitizing the Indian public opinion. This is a card we must play. And if along with that there are some things we can do together with Afghanistan, given the collapse of the relations between Afghanistan and Pakistan, which is likely to endure, if there are certain options opening up there, uh, we should uh, certainly go ahead and we shouldn't feel uh, hesitant uh, to, in doing so. And we must give asylum to Bukti. Why not? They give asylum to the Khalistanis and to David uh, Dawood Ibrahim and they gave to Saam bin Laden and God knows where. <laughs> if, okay. if we don't fight Pakistan on Pakistan's western front, mm -hmm. they will bleed us through the eastern borders. So we have to tie down Pakistan on its western borders. That is critical to our long-term interests. Too much we have been focused on Pakistan's eastern borders, the okay. line of control, for example. Mm. We have to tie down Pakistan on its western borders, and there the opportunities are waiting to be utilized by, by India. Okay. And, and one final thing, mm. SARC. I think that is we've got one. unprecedented support within the region. For the first time, mm. we're on an issue of terrorism, the regional countries are with us. Earlier on, we were fighting this battle alone, even within SARC. That, again, is a very positive development. Okay, well, on that note, we'll have to end now. But thank you for watching this show. We'll see you again same time next week.